I'm especially excited about this next two presenters just because we do have a little bit of a pharmacy bias at MedZed, so we're a little excited about that, but I've just been hearing about the work that's been going on here, and I think what's amazing about our next two presenters, our own uh, Mitran, and from Legacy, Anthony Nysis, is you've got two different environments, two different employers, and what they've managed to do by collaborating and coming together is pretty exciting but I don't want to, you know, be a spoiler alert or anything. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Mai and Anthony. Um, so yeah, as uh, we mentioned, I'm Anthony. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of background while Mai's getting hooked up um, on myself and uh, what I do at Legacy. Um, so I am in a unique role as a pharmacist at Legacy. I am the only Transitions of Care pharmacist. And so... Um, Obviously, pharmacy resources are strapped all across whatever area you're looking at, but that's the same with us, and so I'm the only one that's functioning. Um, but I initially started with the goal of um, improving transitions of care into and out of the hospital, and then even sometimes in between, because we all know that care transitions, we think hospital to home, home to hospital, but obviously there's so many different iterations of that, even within the hospital, ICU to floor, and so on. Uh, and so I was hired on to help try and improve some processes and um, hopefully come up with some services that would improve readmissions. Um, and so I initially started focusing on some of the high-risk disease states that we talked about earlier, um, specifically heart failure and COPD. Uh, Legacy was already doing some programs with case management that were focusing on these patients, and um, I kind of uh, joined some of those programs, like cardiac rehab and pulmonary rehab, um, to help improve the medication transitions of these patients. Um, and it was about a year ago that um, Care Oregon um, and Legacy started talking, which ended up being a very good thing. Um, because we were doing a lot of the same work, but we weren't talking to each other about it. Um, and so, um, and as we began to start to meet and talk about maybe some of the areas of improvement, um, it seemed like we both had very similar focuses in what we were trying to do. And with that um, came this project, actually, Medication Reconciliation. Our whole goal um, was to really just improve communication um, between health plan, so care organ in this instance, and the hospital. So um, obviously we have pieces of information that wouldn't be available to Care Oregon. Vice versa, Care Oregon has a lot of information that's not necessarily directly available to us. And so by improving this um, collaboration, um, we've been able to see some pretty cool results and uh, been able to see some um, evol evolution in not only the services that we offer, but some of the care that we're offering and the coordination that we're offering as well. Okay, um, and so this actually is kind of like a parallel project, but this um, started with Care Oregon patients and is expanding very rapidly. Um, we're doing what's called a Meds to Bed program at Legacy at this current moment, um, where essentially we are um, trying to get all of the capture all the discharge prescriptions um, at discharge, fill them out at our pharmacy, and deliver it to the bedside before the patient actually leaves the hospital. Um, and then the reason that this is important is because actually about 50% of patients um, don't fill their medications at discharge. 25% um, of patients don't fill them at all. And so what we're looking at is trying to get that 25% and get that half, get that 50%, get their medications, get them teaching on those medications, um, and then make sure that everything looks good. Um, this is also a way that we can actually address barriers, such as financial issues. Um, we have a lot of financial programs that we offer at Legacy um, to help patients afford these first 30 days of medications. Um, and uh, we also um, really wanted to focus on the teaching aspect of it as well, because as was mentioned in the previous presentation, um, it's pretty common for patients to not have a very good understanding of their medications or no understanding at all. And so we're really trying to increase our outreach to these patients, getting a pharmacist to the bedside um, to do that kind of counseling. Okay, um, and so um, as you can see here, this is our little flow of um, how this actual workflow has been working out um, and how it's kind of evolved. Um, but it really starts, and it's big circle really for a lot of these patients, right? Um, and so on admission, um, I run a report every day looking for care organ patients that have um, one of uh, a multiple disease states, so either heart failure, COPD, myocardial infarction, AFib, and then um, also looking very closely at patients with uncontrolled diabetes. 
Um, we are starting to expand this also to some of those other high-risk disease states like pneumonia um, and sepsis. We're looking at, we're gonna start to try and enroll those patients as well. But after I identify those patients, I tell my, hey, we have X and X here. Um, I, give them, I give her some basic information, and then she actually works up an assessment. Um, and this is a very comprehensive assessment about what's been happening in the past six months, um, what kind of changes have been going on. Um, it also gives me information on PCP, because once again, we, I even heard that we're having problems hooking up on PCP and getting the right PCP. So um, she gives me the PCP. Um, and then really nice for me um, is claims data on prescriptions. Um, this helps me actually do the admission med medication reconciliation for patients, which is an extremely important part of the process of getting patients into the hospital and improving that quality of medications. Because oftentimes you'll see med lists that get reconciled by physicians, meaning they order off this home med list that was from like 2013 right, um, old med lists. And oftentimes you can even see in each health system that these um, med lists are different at Peace Health. There's a different one at Legacy. There's a different one with a PCP. And so my starts to synthesize all that information, gives it to me, um, and then I actually go to the bedside and interview the patient. So we're looking at getting multiple sources of information on medications. And then talking with the patient to say, Does this, is this correct to you? Is this how you're taking it? So that way we can get the most accurate medication history. So, um, in terms of uh, what we do in the midstream, so uh, down on the bottom right, you can see that um, we start to proactively identify barriers to medication adherence, be that financial issues. Um, oftentimes, one of the most common reasons patients have problems with medications, especially brand name, is prior auth. So how can we actually, prior authorizations, I should say. So um, how do we actually um, resolve those barriers for the patient? Um, and we can do that in the hospital while they're sitting there um, getting their normal treatment. Maya and I are working on the paperwork to get these patients access to these medications. Um, this will also be where we can identify any other kind of barriers, such as rides, follow-up issues, um, general health literacy issues, um, which is a, a huge chunk of it. Um, and so, um, uh, when they're, once they're get, getting geared up for discharge, um, I will look at the discharge orders, all the medications, review them to make sure that they're correct, that they match the plan that we have gone with throughout the hospital, and also a good plan for patients at home. And then, we uh, do the medication bedside delivery, deliver the medications to the patient, um, and do teaching. Um, then I send a little handoff to my saying, this is the new medication list. Um, these are what's been changed. This is what's new, discontinued. Um, and then my will kind of engage the appropriate resources, which she'll talk about. So, um, so upon this chart, so after Anthony kind of hand off to me, um, I also kind of, well, little step up, um, one step back a little bit. Um, so as I received the, um, the referral from Anthony. Depends on what kind of resource needed. I will I'll reach out to a specific team, like either within our own organizations or community partner. Depends on which clinic they at, um, to refer them to either social worker or to refer them to a transitional care um, and outreach nurse um, in-house. Um, so that we can kind of work together preparing so that when they discharge, we'll be able to kind of connect with them directly or hand them off to the primary care um, with all of these information so they can be able to continue coordinate care and also um, um, promptly follow up with the primary care again or specialist if need to. Um, and then I can either do a telephonic post this chart check-in on the medication, making sure, okay, so you have all of your medications. Is there any further question? How are you taking them? Especially with new medication, I want to make sure that is there any side effect, um, is there any problem taking them um, on times um, as instructed. Um, and then also making sure that, okay, do you have everything that you need, um, whether it's Home health has checking in with you. Um, do you have all the necessary um, equipment that's sent to you? Because a lot of time, patient may be sending home with like nebulizer solution, but they don't have the machine. So <laughs> that's like one of the biggest barrier. If you go home with COPD and you don't have the machine, you can't use the NEP. Um, um, also, just kind of working with the nurse um, and also the primary care, trying to kind of coordinate and making sure that they're getting all of their medication, not just for the 30 days post-discharge, but continue with that plan in place as well. 
Um, and then also, if need to, um, depends on the resource from the clinics, um, I might hand it off to a clinic pharmacist to continue monitoring them for um, intensive management on the diabetes or any of the chronic disease um, or anti-coag if they need to. Um, Sometimes our patients um, also having problem engaging with more services, and so I'm working with um, our transitional care program trying to kind of bridge some of those gaps because the patient may have um, issues going out to see the clinics um, very often, and in, in the meantime, they staying home but not getting better. So we're trying to kind of either do a home visit, checking in, um, making sure, okay, do you have everything in place? Um, how are you managing your medication? Do you need you know, more support at home? Um, so ultimately, trying to kind of follow them for the first 30 days post the chart to make sure everything kind of in place, um, and then handing off to the primary care or another team to follow them, either whether a palliative care team or um, advanced illness care team will follow them for ongoing care coordinations. Okay, so um, this is the data that we've collected so far. Um, so as we mentioned, this program has been running for rough, roughly under a year. Um, and we've been able to capture quite a few patients. Um, I think one, uh, most of the patients are Medicaid-only patients, although we also will see um, dual-eligible patients as well. Um, and one thing that I think we're both really proud of is the readmission rate. Um, so you can see that the group that we chose actually had an extremely high readmission rate um, at 30%. So we were, we were picking some pretty sick people, um, obviously um, some very uh, late stage heart failure patients and COPD, and so talking about palliative care. And um, one thing that we were kind of learning as we got through this, and one thing that also kind of helped explain that high readmission rate in the control group is the fact that a lot of these patients, my was referring to palliative care, or we were referring to palliative care actually in the hospital. Um, palliative care resources are extremely limited, however, so the amount that we can actually get to these patients is uh, uh, pretty small, or at least there's a huge area of improvement there. Um, but we were actually able to um, reduce the admissions down to 25%. Um, so we had a 5% total re reduction in readmissions, or about 11 total, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it doesn't take a whole lot to move that needle. Um, really, you only need to prevent about one out of every 20 readmissions to start seeing some good statistical differences, um, especially in terms of penalties. So we're very happy with that number. Um, we also kind of had a rough, although this hasn't been validated, a rough cost savings, um, maybe uh, both to the, the hospital and um, to Care Oregon, of around $100,000, um, just estimating that it costs about $9,000 per admission of these patients. Um, and another thing that we're, both, we're very proud of is that we're improving the accuracy of the discharge medication list. So this includes preventing errors, um, duplications, um, missing items, and things of that nature. Um, and so uh, the way that we did this was actually we were looking at patients that were discharged on the weekend. Because um, right now this is a Monday to Friday service, and I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, but right now it's a Monday to Friday service, so we have that weekend um, gap. And so we actually compared the discharge medication lists on the weekends to the weekdays uh, when we were actually looking at these. Um, and we improved the discharge list accuracy from 77% to 94%. So we still had some errors kind of creep through, some duplications and things like that, but um, overall we did pretty well there. Um, and then at the bottom, I think, is another very interesting thing to look at um, in terms of comorbidities um, and some social barriers that we, saw we were really encountering at a very high rate with the, this care organ population. 87% um, of these patients had severe persistent mental illness. So we were working with um, a heavy behavioral health population as well, which presents its own barriers to care outside of just chronic disease management. Um, also, 45%, so roughly half, had documented substance abuse. Um, and a, roughly a third of the patients that we were working with were homeless or had unstable housing. Um, so we were working with a very um, needy population in terms of services that they needed to truly be successful um, in the outpatient world. Um, and so probably the most interesting to you is kind of what have our findings been? Um, overall, you can see from the data that we have improved um, some of the quality of the transitions of care um, in these patients. Um, we've, like I mentioned before, we've noticed that palliative care is extremely important and um, we've trying, we're trying to engage palliative care very frequently in patients that would benefit from it um, as, because palliative care, once again, is one of the big um, 
uh, ways to reduce readmissions um, and actually improve quality of care for patients. Um, well, some of our challenges that we've been running into is that we really want to get clinic pharmacists involved because we have a couple pieces here, but, we need, but there are other pieces that could even improve this further. And so getting clinic pharmacists involved with medication reconciliation in the clinics, um, getting um, pharmacists to see these patients on a continuous basis to make sure that everything's staying um, good and everything is looking good in terms of their medications. Um, and so we are trying to find ways to engage our clinic pharmacists a little bit more, especially within legacy. Um, and we think that that would improve quite a bit. Um, and then obviously we've had some challenges with um, the high proportion of um, socially um, needy patients um, or behavioral factors. What are your perceived barriers in engaging clinic pharmacists? Um, so it actually has a lot to do with those pharmacists' role in the clinics. Um, typically, pharmacists in a clinic role will be managing diabetes. Honestly, that's what 90% of our, our clinic pharmacists do at Legacy, um, and that's just provider preference. And so you, oftentimes you see that clinic pharmacists don't have the time because they have a full slate of diabetes patients. Also, anticoag is another thing that, pay, uh, like warfarin management, um, is uh, something that some of our clinic pharmacists do as well that takes up a lot of their time. And so really it's just an unavailability of pharmacists. And, yeah, sure. Yeah, and I, I, we have been trying to engage Multnomah County, and I think we still have been running into some of the issues with time for pharmacists. It takes a very long amount of time to do a good medication reconciliation, and we'd love for pharmacists to get involved. We've been trying to do that from the get-go, and I think we're, we're, we're trying to increase that as we go, um, and we're trying to work out more partnerships, and hopefully that'll be something we see in the future. I think one of the other thing I would mention, too, with difficulty engaging clinic pharmacists is not just from OWL, like, trying to collaborate, but also like with the member or with the patients. Because sometimes we will be like, oh, you know, you should be working with a clinic pharmacist. You know, we will happy to make a referral and then you can work with them ongoing. Um, but a lot of our member not actively engaged with the clinics for whatever reason, could be social um, issues or, or behavioral health. And so for them to even make it to the primary care to see the provider, that's a like a big thing, um, even just to make that appointment and then have to kind of tag team with the pharmacist. Some patient, like we will help them schedule and then like right before the appointment, they will call and cancel it. And so I think that was one of the gap too, is that the patient's not really buying in to seeing the providers. Um, so Yeah, there definitely still is a gap between perceived value for patients with pharmacist visits Yeah, just I, not. So For there sure. will be cases that like I will refer to the clinic pharmacist and they're willing to take the patients, but they, but patients just haven't made it to the clinic at all. And so in, in between all of that, um, transition care nurses and I will go and see the patient at home and trying to kind of report back to the primary care, trying to kind of like, hey, you know, this is what's going on. We're trying to get them to go in, but we haven't been able to. They're not willing to. So I think that was one of the gap too. that you have read and write access to each other's records in a way, right? So you can read, you have visibility to see, and then you can also contribute. So I think that's impactable because you don't really have that in many systems. Yeah, true, and, and to your point, Mai's able to read, um, uh, but I'm able to write in the inpatient chart, and so actually the assessment that uh, Mai gives me, I actually put into the chart so that it is completely visible to all uh, disciplines. Yeah, and, and I also want to mention that if I identify during like the referral process um, that the patient's already actively engaged with a clinic pharmacist, I try to call that clinic pharmacist directly and say, hey, you know, this patient that you're following is actually at currently inpatients. Um, please connect with the inpatient pharmacist like Anthony, and I pass on information so at least they can connect directly and versus like going through me if the patient's already engaged. So. Um, is there any um, research being done about the barriers to engaging with clinical pharmacists in clinics? Because um, you mentioned a few potential reasons, like the patient is not willing, doesn't see the benefit. Is there any problem solving? Like step, I guess step two would be, is there any problem solving on that end, motivational interviewing, different things like that or, that are implemented in order to kind of smooth that um, transition or facilitate it? So, so far we um, actually aren't completely done um, with this workflow itself. So we actually haven't worked too um, 
uh, intensely in terms of like research and looking into barriers to uh, accessing those clinic pharmacists. Um, but um, to your point, that's some, once again, that's some, an area that we really are trying to get into. Um, and I think as we go on, this workflow is going to start to become pretty streamlined. Um, we're still working every day to try and find the right patients to follow and the right kind of interventions to make. And yeah, absolutely. I think one thing also is that with those specific patients who have barrier going to the clinic, that's why we're trying to kind of bring it home to them. Um, and that's why I'm trying to kind of make home visit with the nurse or um, home health, trying to kind of engage them and kind of get them to used to working with a pharmacist and this is kind of like the setup um, so that eventually hopefully hand them back to a clinic pharmacist or if barrier is them getting out of the house maybe bring primary care in home like through health care provider might be another option it depends on their comfort level can i just point out with your, in terms of the the home visit um, piece too there there is a lot of value to to seeing the patient in their home with their bags and bins full of medications and what their home environment is and, and helping them set up and then being able to interpret that to the clinic um, so that the clinic kind of understands what what what's going on there too so I think um, I just wanted to point out that having the, the capacity to do some home visitation with pharmacy is really really cool Plus, we also have um, an in-home nursing assessment program uh, where nurse practitioners could always go out and do exactly that and do with Medicare. With Medicare. Yeah, with Medicare. I have a question for you, Anthony. Um, uh, is there a clinical pharmacist at uh, Unity? Uh, no, there actually is not. So it's all distribution pharmacists right now at Unity. So we actually have a med reconciliation program for our Medicare members with our, um, our Care Oregon behavioral health pharmacist. Yeah. So we're, we're starting that program, very much in model of the program that we're running with Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So how about, so I, I, work, I work in Virginia Garcia, and I'm just thinking about, you know, um, I manage the outpatient pharmacist, and I'm just thinking about ways that we could potentially get involved, but I'm wondering what uh, any billing, like what, what kind of, is there any information about how we could bill for some of these services? That's a super excellent question. And at this moment, we have not nailed down um, a, like an appropriate billing strategy, uh, partially because it's, it becomes really difficult outside of like MTM, which MTM would be a way that we can maybe capture some billing and some revenue. Um, but outside of MTM, it gets really difficult to kind of define those services and then get paid for them. Um, the most that I know of this actually happening is actually in Washington. Um, Washington does have a little bit more um, infrastructure to where they will accept billing. Um, although, from my understanding, or at least the last that I've heard, those pharmacists still aren't getting paid for those services. But we really actually looked at that pretty intensely at first, um, seeing if we could get billed for some of the services that I'm providing in the hospital. Because they do, they are very similar to MTM, you know, complete medication review, um, actually identifying barriers for patients. So a lot of what I do actually kind of looks like an MTM. And sorry, for those that don't know what that means, medical therapy management is something that outpatient pharmacies can do um, to call into a patient, review their medications, and then relay any findings to the PCP. Um, and they, you can bill for that. Pharmacists can't bill for that. Um, so yeah. So um, we, we did look at that, but we have not found any good way to do that. And I think we actually got a no in terms of billing for my particular services, a hard no. <laughs> For inpatient. Yeah, inpatient, yeah. It's like, how can you, how can you, you know, put your resources towards that if you're not going to get paid for those services? So just yeah. telling, shout out for that. So. Yeah, and I, and I think that kind of lends to your point, actually, um, about um, the difficulty in engaging clinical pharmacists. So um, it also has a, it's an organizational buy-in piece of this. Like if a clinic was, pharmacist was really to get engaged in this, there would need to be some significant buy-in from not only the pharmacist, but the clinic and the providers. Um, because it is, once again, a huge time commitment. Um, and yeah, how do you justify that with a pharmacist's salary? Hey, so I'm with VG, actually, too. And 
We, we do have this challenge because we do have a clinical pharmacist, but we know that their services are limited and what they can do. So our workaround in our clinic is that we actually schedule, and the patients won't come in. Mm -hmm. They don't want to engage. They might identify with their provider. So we actually schedule telemed with the provider, and the provider sometimes can manage to get a warm handoff in mm -hmm. to the clinical pharmacist, or that's a way for the primary care provider to actually bill for the service of doing the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Hi, also from Virginia Garcia. <laughs> um, so we all work at different clinics in different locations, and what we are doing at our particular location is we're running a transitional uh, care team where clinical pharmacists is actually embedded into the transitional team. And so um, it actually addresses some of the barriers in having patients see clinical pharmacists, because when we try to get patients just to see a clinical pharmacist, a lot of times they don't understand what that is. Mm -hmm. And so to have CPS within a team where they're seeing an MD and, and all of these other health professions, um, it's, it's automatically available to them and they don't necessarily have a choice when they're seeing the whole team. And so we really, um, you know, address, I guess, that particular barrier. And to, to speak to Chris's point, um, billing-wise too, it's all kind of lumped into this one session and so it's billed under the provider. Right, mm -hmm. which yep. eliminates that piece of it yep. from my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think one of the cost savings potentially is um, the penalties for readmission. Um, so I think that that can be used. Um, I mean, this, this data can be used in order to support um, clinics buying into this. Certainly. Because there's a huge uh, benefit for that as well. C certainly, and that's why we're kind of out and about sharing some of this information, because um, we do have some pretty good data to support what we're doing, and um, hopefully that our data will continue to show that. And I have to say, one of the goal that we kind of shifted a little bit and or add in to our goal, like originally to reduce like readmissions, is also. Some of these folks are super sick, but for whatever reason, palliative care has been offered multiple times and they decline. I mean, they have the right to decline that service, but in the meantime, they continue to circling the hospital. So what do we do? And I think one of the things that Anthony and I am trying to address is what can we do to support that, that decisions and maybe not necessarily redu like reduce readmission, but maybe lengthen out the interval between hospitalizations or reduce the length of state. Um, I, I, I personally, I think that is something that a lot of the time we don't look at because our patient population is super sick. Um, I mean, our enrollments in palliative care service is really high too, and then um, the debt rate is really high as well. And so, um, what can we do in the between to help them um, not getting to the hospital as often? I'm curious about the transition from your program to their far home pharmacy, whether it's Walgreens or something in the community. Um, I had a patient recently who discharged from OHSU on Lantus for the first time. And so she utilized the inpatient pharmacy or, or the one across mm -hmm. the street to get it the first time. But then her son was really confused that her mom and pop pharmacy in our neighborhood had never heard of her being on Lantus. Yeah, so actually we address this through our meds to bed program. Um, any refills that are on discharge prescriptions get automatically transferred um, by our team to the home pharmacy um, because we identified that as a huge barrier and something that we needed to address. And then the other piece of it too is with the meds to bed counseling, um, I make it a point to talk about refills. Um, how do you get refills? Because a lot of times you'll see the providers discharge with 30 days, no refills, right? They <laughs> Yeah, because they expect that the patient will follow up within 30 days and everything is going to be ideal and the dream world of how the patient actually engages their resources. Um, and so we actually spend time to talk about uh, you, the reason that it's going to be really important to follow up is not only because of this reason, but also because you're going to need refills of these medications. So we spent a lot of time saying, this is not going to be a, just a short-term medication. This will be something that you'll be taking indefinitely. And so that I try to include that in the counseling as well at the bedside. And I think the other piece, too, is that um, we're trying to kind of catch some of the override needed at the outpatients when you're trying to do mess to bed. And if there's, like, say, this medication normally not covering through, um, say, Care Oregon Medicaid, are trying to kind of 
put that ORI in place ahead of time so that at least that first 30 day will go through um, until they can be seen by primary care. Generally speaking, transition of care follow them for about 30 days. Pharmacy, I tend to follow them about 45 to 60 days just to make sure that they actually get the second um, refill and at least something in place. Um, now, if I hand it off to the clinic pharmacist and they engage, then I can close that case earlier. But if they don't have any clinic pharmacist support in like a smaller clinic, I tend to follow them a little longer. Uh, we're at an OHSU clinic on the other side of town, so we don't have a huge volume of patients that go, but usually I'm looking at care everywhere to mm -hmm. sort of discern what the discharge med list is. But there isn't always one available at the time of discharge because it tends to be embedded in the sum discharge summary, which mm -hmm. there's some time to complete that. Um, or if, if it is, it often feels like it was going off a list from whatever their previous oh, yeah. admission to your hospital was, mm -hmm. which I don't know, was maybe three years ago and a lot of things have changed and so I'm like, well, these five vitamins are not no longer relevant and I can usually pick out like the key changes that were made because they're delineated, but the basic mid list, um, I get, and I don't know what the solution to that is. I guess I'm just sort of raising the uh, this is what my experience is receiving the patient from the hospital, and I'm not sure who to contact or what yeah. to do. Yeah, that's that's a massive, massive gap because it takes it takes um, some very uh, intense resources to actually fix that problem. Um, because what uh, what the ideal flow would be, and what Maya and I actually try and do, so I give her that that list that says start, stop, change whatever, and I give that to my, but then my still would need to communicate that to the clinic, right? Mm -hmm. And then who in, who in the clinic's hands do you put that into um, is the other question, too. So we can send information, but is it getting to the right places? Um, is it actually being updated in the outpatient clinic charts? And so you can see, I mean, cliche alert, it takes a village. It really does. Uh, if there's going to be one takeaway from this whole project is that um, everybody needs to be involved in transitions because it's amazing what we might see and we can try to address any barriers, but without having each piece of the care team involved, it, it starts to get a little messy and then that snowballs and then years down the road, start to see old med lists from three years ago and things like that. I do try to address it if I catch it on post this chart and I see, because we have patients who say, um, PCP is at um, OHSU South Waterfront, um, but then they admit it at Legacy Emanuel, but then they, their cardiology is also at Emanuel. And OHSU and Legacy have two separate met lists that does not reconcile. Um, so upon this chart, after I get um, Anthony list, um, I try to c connect with both um, clinic um, directly and say, hey, you know, I noticed that there is discrepancy on your met list. This is what I have. Can you please reconcile with the member next time when they come in? Um, we also have a member who kind of in between PCP. So um, most recently, we have one that was previously at Virginia Garcia um, and then transferred to um, a legacy clinic, have one PCP new patient established care with legacy clinic, and then admit it to Tualities Hospital. So it's three different system, and they, none of them talk to each other. Um, legacy clinic wasn't even aware the patient was in the hospital. Um, I did a kind of post this chart follow-up on the med rack on the patients, and call the legacy clinic um, and kind of reconcile all of that with them and also notify them that patient was in the hospital recently, please follow up, probably because you don't get the notifications and patients knew. So I, I really trying to kind of reconcile that. And usually if I, um, if I notice that and there's a clinic pharmacist involved, I call that clinic pharmacist directly um, and trying to kind of give that met list so at least there's kind of like a warm handoff versus just kind of fax it over randomly, so. <laughs> so you guys are making me think of that public health <laughs> model where we're pulling bodies out of the river and I'm thinking about root cause and upstream and I'm wondering have you given any thought because the only thing that I know that crosses all the hospital systems is pre-managed but right now it's really just a list of patients mm -hmm. it's not super helpful it's good for addresses so what if it had the most current med list from all the different systems and you saw all the garbage in one place and that was where you actually put your resources. Have you given that any thought? We actually are working on, we're working on 
that. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll hear a little more about pre-manage um, later in this session. Um, but yes, we are looking at how to get uh, med lists uploaded. And at least for CARE Oregon, we're in the process of looking at having at least a 90-day uh, rolling calendar where we know they're filling um, and so forth. But there's a lot of work going on around that, that very piece. Yeah. Is there any collaboration with other other CCOs besides just CARE Oregon? Because a lot of our patients are not CARE Oregon patients. I, so collective. Uh, Liz, Liz will be here this afternoon. Yeah. Liz uh, Whitworth, who is um, who is working doing the uh, pre-managed work for CARE Oregon, but she's working across the state with all agencies and OHA. partners and as part of the larger groups um, doing this. And she's working very closely with CMT, who um, who owns pre-managed Eddy. So yes, yeah. that is happening. And the hospitals don't know it as pre-managed. So right. it took like a couple of visits Eddie. for them yeah. to go, oh, Eddie. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so you'll hear more about that too. Cause, and also, yeah. you'll be hearing some about um, uh, bringing sniffs on board with, with pre-managed as well. So. You're definitely reading ahead, so that's good. <laughs> We're going to just real quick, uh, Mai and Anthony, just get, getting ready to close this section out. So I just want to be mindful of everyone's time, guys. So let's go ahead and let them go ahead and finish their thing. Um, okay, so just some next steps. Um, obviously, we're trying to get some more weekend coverage. Um, so uh, that will be challenging, but that's something that we really are looking to um, expand into because we know that there are some huge gaps um, in every stage of transitions of care, but also in medications. Um, we're going to continue to expand the meds to bed service as well. So we're actually almost full hospital at this point. Um, and recently, at least in the past two weeks, we've also opened up to um, some additional units, and we're doing about 15 to 20 deliveries a day. So actually a little bit even more than what we were expecting at this point in time. Um, we're also continuing to look at streamlining workflow um, because with the other projects going on that Mai's involved with, me being involved in the meds to bed, um, we're looking at ways to really try and prioritize patients the best way, which patients are the most impactable for our services. Um, and we're gonna continue to look at that and then we're hoping to get some more um, data analysis support because there's a ton of data to um, sift through um, in this type of project. And so we need a little bit extra help there. So that's what we're going to be looking at doing. So just a note, when I'm looking at hospital discharges in care everywhere, and I can see there's a, been a pharmacy visit at apothecary, what have you, it would be really helpful if they would actually document what they dispensed because mm. oftentimes I'm calling to figure out what they actually got. I'm not familiar with that documentation. There, it shows a pharmacy visit in Care Everywhere. Oh, okay, okay. But there's no documentation. I, that's interesting because that, that must auto fire because at, at, as far as I know, our pharmacists aren't actively putting those yeah. visits in. But yeah, that would absolutely be something that would be worthwhile. One thing I also want to mention, it's not on our slide, but that's something kind of we've been working on and I would like to kind of continue expanding that, um, is we following patient discharge to sniff pretty closely because um, we also noticed that, as Jane mentioned earlier, when patient discharge to sniff, it's kind of like into a big black hole, like PCP not necessarily following them, house doc following them with the order, but they only may be seen once a week. Um, in the meantime, the pharmacy and the staff at SNF filling the reception without nobody really checking to see is it really reconciled, is everything filling okay, is there a problem with like prioritizations. Um, so, I'm, so Anthony had been very good with kind of flag me ahead of time that, hey, this patient is about to discharge a SNF, so I can kind of prioritize to check in on SNF um, quickly um, for like just making sure everything reconcile correctly. Um, and then especially with like IV antibiotics, because um, we got problem in the past that patient discharge with IV vancomycins um, for a um, pig lie infections. So the pig lie was removed. Um, the order was put in to long-term care pharmacy. Long-term care pharmacy filled the prescription, sent it to SNP. SNP was like, oh, there's no pick. Oops, must be wrong. Send it right back to long-term care pharmacy. And so the patient was out of IV vancomycin for at least four days because it was a discharge over the weekend. So I didn't catch it until Monday when I come back and I'm like, wait a second, why the patient's not on IV Vanco? Um, so that was something that we kind of trying to work on together to make sure that there wasn't any fall through um, for patients. So 
Any questions? Well, I think what we'll do is we'll be able to have a little bit more time to uh, pick my and Anthony's brains during our Q&A panel session at the end. But to keep us on time and keep us all honest, it's time to go to break. So please give a warm, warm round of applause to these guys. You're doing fantastic, exciting work. My and Anthony.